All right. Good morning. Welcome. All that work. <laughs> he did a great job getting <laughs> set up technology wise. So um, I want to thank you all for being with me. And um, I mean, everyone knows me except you. So my name is Beth Bond. Um, I have the largest online news site for sustainable business and environmental policy in the Southeast. We cover 13 states. And as I've done my work with um, Southeast Green, I've also really developed my faith. And so about two years ago, I started speaking. I decided UMW is my new tribe because y'all get stuff done. <laughs> so, um, so they've asked me to speak today. And um, I do have a, a sort of 101 program, like I said, that I'll be more than happy to come and present to your UMW. But um, today we're going to talk about climate justice, which is a, it's a little bit different. So let's go on and get in the program. So, um, right in the beginning, and God said it was good. But when it comes to talking about climate justice, things get a little confusing. So, um, this is a quote from, I don't know what the picture is. There we go. So, this is a quote from a public service commissioner in Alabama. Coal was created by God. Federal government should not enact policy that runs counter to God's plan. Who has the right to take God's gift to us as a state? So when politics and religion collide, we get sort of strange bedfellows. So it's sort of interesting that um, this public service commissioner, thank goodness he's not one of ours, he's over in Alabama. For those of you all know me, everything bad in Alabama. So um, my, um, I'm from Alabama, so I can talk bad. So, um, but you know, when you have a public service commissioner standing up publicly and saying these kinds of things, it gets confusing. Because I mean, we do think we have dominion, right? And there's specifically sort of a, a, a tract of religion that thinks dominion means ownership and we can abuse it as much as possible. Where, you know, if we have ownership over our children per se, or our pets, we love them and we take care of them, but for some reason it's been convoluted that when we have ownership over the earth, Oh, we can just abuse it. So, of course, my counter to this was um, Isaiah 65, 25, which is, they shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountains, says the Lord. So clearly, the public service commissioner missed this verse. And by the way, there's, you know, um, uh, something called a Green Bible, which I've discussed with some of y'all before. And what they did is they went in and they found every single passage to do with um, creation care essentially, which is caring for the planet and for humans, and they highlighted it in green. So you can check out the Green Bible if you want um, something to, you know, sort of help you in, in this journey of creation care. Oh, yeah. Is that on Gateway, do you know? I don't, that's a good question. I don't know. Matthew Sleep, who spoke two years ago at the Creation Care Conference, um, he was actually one of the instigators to get that Bible done. So, and I know that Gipple, um, so Gipple is Georgia Interfaith Power and Light, and I serve on the board. And so I know they've got a copy um, of it too. So, um, so this is some of the ways that our God-given right to sources of energy has sort of turned out. Anybody, anybody recognize that? So these are barges. So this is the BP oil spill. Oh, right. There, there's our God-given right. So clearly we're not doing a good job of managing our God-given right. Um, any, any idea where, what this is? All right, has it got a glare? No, this is actually the tar sands up in North Dakota. And um, where they're going in, you know, when, when it's basically shut down, right, because gas is so cheap again. But, you know, the tar sands is full of gas and there's this very high extraction, extraction process. This doesn't really feel like, to me, like we're managing our resources very well. Um, this one is going to be really hard to tell um, because it was taken in the fall. But does anybody know what this is? So that is coal uh, top mountain removal. This is where they're blowing the tops of the mountains off so we can extract coal. Um, this is this one I had not seen before. This is um, fracking wells in Montana. Oh. So, you know, I, 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 think, I think this sort of begs the question, are we really, 
you know, managing our, our sources of energy well? And is, is this really what we want the solution to be? So, um, and I had the same response to those pictures when I saw them. You know, we've got a great God-given source, and we don't have to blow up anything, right? So, um, but, you know, for some reason, the other sources of energy are better God-given sources than something that basically we see every single day. It falls for free. So, you know, we looked at some pictures of, of, of climate and what we've done to it, you know, what we've done to the earth. But the question is, is how does how does that injustice look like? What does that reality look like? So, um, one of the things that really it's important for us to know that what we do here affects everyone else, right? So we're already seeing one inch sea levels. It's now confirmed that we have one inch sea levels all the way down the eastern seaboard. You might have heard that Miami Beach is doing all kinds of crazy things and so just saying, okay, we surrender or coming up with a climate plan. Um, but we don't think about, well, it's now in the Gulf Coast. And so there's that, you know, that means hurricanes, like we saw with Sandy and the amount of water. Um, and this is, this is in Bangladesh after a flood. And what people don't realize about Bangladesh is, is it is basically, Bangladesh is just a huge tributary. It's, their entire culture is based on water. And this is um, something we're gonna see a lot more of. And they're anticipating 27.5 million refugees being displaced in Bangladesh with the rise of water. 27.5. What do you do with 27.5? I mean, you know, it's it's one thing we're like, it's sort of nicey nicey. We move a couple of people off of islands in the Pacific, but what do you do with 27.5 million? Especially when you're already one of the poorest countries in the world, anyway. Right. There's exactly. No resources. And where do they write it? So um, this is a picture from the Syrian refugee crisis, and what's really interesting about this is there are now climatologists. I'm not going to debate whether the science is real, but there are climatologists saying that the reason that Syria um, destabilized so quickly is because they were in a massive drought. And that's from an extreme weather pattern that's being caused by climate. Like I said, I can't prove that, but you know, this is what this is what justice issues look like for us when we're talking about climate shifts, right? Anybody recognize this? So this is New Orleans from Katrina. Um, you know, Katrina was 10 years ago, and there's a lot of people who are saying, well, you know, climate wasn't back then. I don't know, but this, this Katrina may not be caused by, you know, climate change, but this is, you know, anything going forward is gonna look like that. You know, if you've got one extra inch of water in the Gulf, or on the, I mean, think about, I mean, Sandy, they're saying Sandy, look, the reason it was so bad was because there's an extra inch. You think about all those millions and millions of gallons pushing on extra because we've got an extra inch of, of water. So, um, and right now it kind of looks like that again, just with rainfall. Right. right. They're having, I saw pictures of people being evacuated, just, oh. Well, and the predictions of five or six years ago of like, well, it's not global warming, it's climate change, and that means we're going to have more extreme weather events. Does anybody think that's happening? <laughs> I'm just saying. And then I think y'all seen this picture before. But this is this is another sort of climate justice issue. Does anybody know what this is? So the, oh y'all just this is um, Tybee Island. So they have king tides. Okay, so a king tide is like a super um, high tide. And during a king tide three or four years ago, this is the highway that goes out to Tybee from Savannah. They didn't used to have flooding, but because of the increase in the water, this is what king tides look now. And you know, it you know, normally when we think about justice issues, we think about the poor and the least of these. But now we're talking about people on Tybee Island who can't get off the island. So it's becoming not simply an issue of justice in regards to the poor but everyone's gonna be affected by it. So um, this is another um, slide that I got from Sean that I thought was really interesting. Um, this is health and social costs of coal uh, in Appalachia. How many of y'all do an Appalachian mission trips? My church goes to Appalachia every single year. Um, and you know, this, this slide really illustrates to me the real 
public health because that's one of the things we think of climate, we think of trees, and we think of extinction and animals, but we do we don't really do a good job of connecting that human factor. Well, here's the human factor. So 11,000 excess uh, deaths annually from the mining of coal. Um, public health, we all pay for public health. Um, emissions of air pollutants, which goes back to public health. In areas where there's higher pollutants, of course, there's higher asthma. And so, you know, who's paying for those asthma, right? Who, you know, we have a higher rate of asthma right now in the U.S. than we've ever had before with children, and it's because of all the particulate matter we've got floating around. Um, and then they've got reproductive issues. And, and you know, the, the argument for mining is, well, it brings job. Well, it turns out that mining increases, um, but so does poverty rates and unemployment rates, while the educational attainment rates and household income levels decline. So, you know, we bring in mining and we bring in these jobs, and yet it's having an adverse effect on on the population. You know, I don't I don't know what else has justice in that. So um, I see I see instead of us blowing up mountains to coal like windmills, you know, and and, and solar. So um, I just read a really bad novel, uh, John Grisham, Great Mountain, but it's about coal mining and it talked about the tactics that, that the coal companies use to keep people from getting their benefits for black lung disease. They'll just delay it until people die. Yeah. I mean, literally, they have policies in place that will keep them from having to pay insurance because they just keep dragging it out in court until they die. Well, and you know, the thing is, is that people are like, oh, well, you're anti-corporation. I'm not anti-corporation, but I am for corporate responsibility, right? If, if your corporation is acting negatively and it affects the public health of the entire area, that's wrong. And and so, you know, you know, it's... We live in a really interesting time, right? I mean, things are rapidly changing, and I feel like it's more interesting than it's been for the last 30 years. I can't speak beyond that, but you know, it's 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 interesting that the public starts to say, okay, you know what? We don't like the way you're doing business anymore, and what that's starting to take shape. So, um, I um, so for, I think I said my mother's United Methodist minister, and so I was doing some reading to Paul last year. I was Oh, I can't vote to Paul. He's just awesome. So she handed me one of her seminary books, which is 830 pages, um, and it is. I'm, I'm, I have. I will finish it. I'm halfway through. I remember 317 pages of it, but I'm like, I finally found one paragraph in the whole book, Mother, that really spoke to me. And so what he was talking about was Paul's use of, of, of salvation and how salvation has sort of become estranged from us. We, we use it so much and sort of a theological way we think of salvation and you know there's sort of that sort of evangelical way we think about salvation but that the use of salvation in the Bible really meant something and I thought this was really great so um, I'm not going to try to pronounce it um, but this is the, the I, I believe the Greek word for salvation it would be common in Jewish context to be rescue a bringing to safety and that it wouldn't just apply to um, what we would think of, which is the earth, but it would apply to bodily health and preservation. And I thought, you know what, that's it. We need a time for creation salvation. And creation is everything. It's not, it's not a separation of humanity from the earth. It, it's a time for all of us to, you know, to basically be saved, to rescue what we're doing from the earth, to bring it back to safety. And that safety brings back justice for everyone. So um, I'm like, okay, out of 830 pages, one paragraph. It was worth the read. So um, thank you. Um, now this is this is my fancy Alabama map. This, this is my, my warning. So there's stuff that we can do. There's stuff that um, we don't need to be overwhelmed about, and there's stuff that we can do. And this is what I'd like to do. Like the first thing is energy efficiency for churches. Um, so there are 900 churches in the North Georgia Conference, okay? 450,000 of us in North Georgia, right? So almost half a million. What if 10% of the churches, or what if all our churches reduced our electricity use by 10%? So I know 10,000 for some of those smaller, teeny, tiny churches up north is not 10,000. We're just going to say it all balances out. 
So you took 900 churches times 10,000. Our annual power bills to our utility, this is just power, this doesn't count gas or water or anything else, would be $9 million. And if we reduced our electric bills, and reducing your electrical by 10% is simple. It's not going in and doing an energy ret retrofit or anything. I mean, it's basically reminding people to turn off the lights when they leave rooms. I mean, 10% is nothing. Um, we would say $900,000. Now, for some churches, that $900,000 is you know, a, a deal breaker. But what could the North Georgia Conference do with $900,000, right? Um, what if we spent that money and went back in and started doing deep commissioning retro energy fits, right? And really started to save money. What if we took that $900,000 and started building solar on top of our rooftops? You know, I mean, there's all kinds of things. But, but from a standpoint of what we could do, but what if we took those $900,000 and started working on justice issues? I mean, $900,000 makes a big difference to justice issues. So, um, and, and I'm gonna, I love telling this story. I don't ever tell in North Georgia what the church is because everybody knows what it is. But um, there's one very big church and they didn't have to do anything. All they did was they started doing an energy assessment. And they went in and they looked at the use of their buildings and everything and they had one building that stayed on 24 seven for one meeting on Wednesday mornings and Sunday mornings. And so the guy who was doing the energy assessment said, um, why don't we do this? Why don't we admit, move the ladies who are meeting on Wednesday, I'm sure it was a circle, move those ladies over to the building that we've got to keep on because that's where the admin is, we've got plenty of rooms there. And then shut down that building and only run the electricity on Sundays. They say $23,000 in one year from making a move. You know, they didn't have to turn out, well they turned out the lights, you know what I'm saying, but this is like put signs all over and say turn out the lights. All they did was move one meeting and say $23,000. And you know, I like to tell people we didn't. It's it's not that we were intentionally wasteful. It's, it's you know, it's just we don't think about it. We're so blessed to have all this electricity at our fingertips, and it's just not really make that connection between the bills and everything. Especially if you're on one of those even out plans. You know, my bills just my bill kind of thing. I don't do that. Um, so, but the point is, is is that you know, we just need to be a little more cognizant. And this is simple, easy stuff. You know, we're not asking for solar panels. We're not asking for the trustees to make a decision. We're just asking, you know, groups to, to sort of change the way they use the building. So, um, so that's the first thing I'd like to sort of plug about what we can do to help mitigate what we're doing with climate. Because a lot of times people are like, well, we can't pay money or we don't have enough time or energy to go in and save Bangladesh. I'm like, you don't have to do any of that. You know, if we start working on mitigating what we're doing to the climate, slowing down what's happening, and hopefully reversing some of it, um, then we don't, you know, it's our, our worship and our participation in our local churches becomes our, our message of faith and our participation in helping to reduce that. So um, you can tell these aren't slides I did because they got really technical, but just this is something else that, that's very interesting. So $30 billion a year flows out of Georgia for energy, energy imports. And that's coal, natural gas, and oil for our cars, okay? So, of course, we have no coal in Georgia, which honestly is a good thing because we'd be blowing up mountains if we did. Just ask Alabama. So, um, so we import coal for electricity generation. That is reducing as we switch to natural gas. But we don't have any natural gas either. So we're importing natural gas. And everyone goes, oh, well, that natural gas is better than coal. And, and they're right, natural gas is better than coal. But it's it's really less bad, right? It's not better, per se, it's less bad. There are still issues with natural gas. You saw the picture with all the fracking. You know, do we really want to be part of that, where we, we're we you know, responsible for that? Also, natural gas has methane, and methane, they have, they're having all kinds of issues with meth, meth, methane leaks, and um, Methane is actually worse than um, the carbon emissions you hear about all the time. Isn't so, that what, excuse, isn't that what they call swamp gas? Methane. Uh huh. Yeah. So, um, and it's it's very toxic, and it, and 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 so that's a byproduct. And then, um, of course, there's gasoline, but we we import, you know. So one of the things that we did well completely unintentionally was we had the, uh, you know, we had the, um, 
the leaf, well, it was actually it was an EV tax credit for five thousand dollars, but it made Atlanta the number one location for leafs. And um, I have a lot of fun when my family comes up because I point out, see, you know, there's a leaf. And then they spend the rest of the time, oh, there's another leaf, there's another leaf. Oh, oh my goodness, because we are the largest market for leaves because with that tax credit, it really made a difference. And, and, and you know, saying, well, you charge on natural gas and, and coal, yes, but it's not nearly as energy intensive as, as, as fueling up. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, is your leaf can be charged with solar. It can be charged with wind. So um, as we switch our electric grid over to more renewable energies, and, and honestly, I, I'm telling you, I do not think that wind and, and solar will solve everything. Will it solve a lot? Yeah. I mean, really a lot. But it's not going to solve everything. But I think we've sort of done this backwards. I mean, I understand the economics of it, but the economics is, is, is okay, well, if we can't use coal anymore, well, we'll just switch to natural gas. And oh, by the way, we're just going to build pipelines all over the place, ship natural gas, gas everywhere. When I think what we should do, instead of building pipelines and putting that infrastructure in, we should be building solar and wind. And then see where we need to be, right? See where we need to be after we get full deployment on that. And then we can go back. The natural gas doesn't go anywhere. If we don't drill from it, it's not like it goes away or it gets weaker. It, it just sits there and waits for it. So that's why I think it's really important for us to be conscious of the, the natural gas conversation. Um, we've got two pipelines right now that are proposed. Um, Rick Scott, the governor down in Florida, um, unfortunately has decided that renewables aren't a good thing for Florida, even though the solar potential in Florida is higher than any other place in the country. Well, east of the Mississippi, Florida has the highest capacity. He's decided with um, natural gas that they should do natural gas. Well, we, you know how 75 is like, how do you get to Disney World? Everybody passes through Georgia and goes to 75. Well, that's the strategy they're doing with natural gas. So they've got um, a, a natural gas pipeline that they want to take from Charleston to Jacksonville. Um, and they're, they're fighting that one. And then they've got another one that is insanity. It starts in, it starts in Choctaw, Alabama, runs north, up into Georgia, and then runs back south and down to Orlando. And it's like, well, I don't, you know, I'm okay with being the highway to Disney World, but I'm not sure I'm okay being the highway for natural gas that, from what I understand, at least the Jacksonville line, is going to be exported to Europe. Well, why don't you export it from Charleston to Europe? I mean, there's, I mean, right, it's that kind of mindset that you're just like, what? What are y'all doing? So, um, that's why I believe natural gas really needs to be. And I'm just like, we just put more solar. And I think we as a, a faith-based institution on 450,000 of us, 450,000 of us all gave a dollar for solar. What could we do in the North Georgia Conference? I mean, just a dollar. Just have Solar Sunday and everybody give a dollar and take all that money and start really thinking about how to deploy solar. Big, big differences, right? Um, so anyway, okay. Not that I have an opinion about this. <laughs> Very humble, no opinions. Um, but the other thing is, is that you know, a lot of times people argue, well, you're taking away coal jobs, and 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 in the history of business, new businesses have always taken away and shut down old businesses. We act like this is something new, and oh, the, the humanity of it. And I'm like, but you know, we we have a mechanism to give people new jobs. Let's right? go back to typewriters and mimeograph machines. Right, exactly. <laughs> Let's talk to IBM about that. So, but the point is, is that we have created 20,000 local clean energy jobs, and the difference, you know, like if the oil jobs, you know, they're out in the middle of North Dakota and Montana and everything, but because of the installation and the way this works, solar has created 800, this is, this is, okay, this is the national picture. So, solar has created 801 new companies, and all those people have to be employed, especially I mean, these are guys who are climbing on roofs, right? This is, these are your, you know, your 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 uh, mechanical oriented guys, um, and it's created 3.3 billion dollars in gross revenue for the United States. So, um, you know, where coal, you know, with the Appalachia goes away and we stop coal mining, where do those jobs go? Well, they can they can they can install wind. They, and it's a lot healthier to install wind. I'm not saying there's no risk, but it's a lot healthier to install wind than there is to go and blowing up mountains and all that kind of stuff. So, 
you know, one of the, the, the things about um, the manufacturing economy is, is we export a lot of jobs overseas. So um, my favorite story about this is there's a company in uh, North Cab County, and it's called American Fiber Packaging, and what they do is they collect envelope trimmings essentially from paper plants from all from a 300 mile radius, that's it. And then they make um, clamshells, you know, take out the, the, so they're recycled, made out of recycled content, but then they're recyclable. So, you know, which you put your food in when you leave. And um, a reporter from one of the, the big papers in town asked the guy, well, why is, why is it better to have it local than it is to have it from China? And I looked at the guy and I said, I'll never ask you that question. <laughs> so, you know, why would we export recycled paper to China to bring it back? I mean, talk about, you know, footprints. So that's another thing that's really great about these sustainable jobs and us supporting those sustainable jobs is they're local jobs. It keeps people employed here in Georgia. And um, this, this shows all the stuff that, that solar does. So basically, it's a 37% increase in county jobs. It's a 38% increase in state jobs. So um, this is just uh, a couple of um, uh, energy jobs that we have here that actually export materials out. Um, when they first said Trojan, I, I have to be honest, that's what, what I was thinking about, but it's a battery storage company. So, you know, this is yet Thank another one. Explain. Yeah, I have to admit. So, um, this is um, air conditioning, and these are Cineva, which is uh, solar panels. So, this is like, this guy is Dr., I can't say his name, but it's this long, but he is a rock star in solar circles, that's what I've been told. So, um, he revolutionized efficiency on solar panels. So. Okay, so it, in some ways, um, um, I don't like to get real political, but I just do want to make the connection between the, pro, the, the Clean Power Plan, which is sort of in limbo right now. Um, we should have a ruling in June, but that's basically the, 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 the EPA has set goals by 20, I think it's 20, I think it's 2030. Um, there's a lot of goals targeted around 2020, 2030, 2040, and 2050. So this is saying, um, but if the clean power plan went in place, it would create 273,000 new jobs in the United States alone by 2040. So while people are saying, oh, we're going to lose our jobs, you know, I'm like, well, good, look, we got 273,000 open, so I'm pretty sure we can fill it. So, um, and, and once again, these become local jobs, right? Because it's easy to think about what's going to happen internationally, uh, but we need to think about what's happening here in Georgia. And so creating local jobs, because there was a lot of mill workers, there was a lot of you know, manufacturing jobs that were left as we sent everything over to overseas, and it's not just China, it's everywhere. But you know, these kinds of jobs are infrastructure jobs, they're things we have to do here on the ground. So we're actually providing you know, people of the least of these who've been sort of left out of the new economy, a new opportunity to be employed again. I think that's really exciting. Um, so here's here's a little like, well, what if somebody says, you know, oh, we don't need regulation and the government and blah, 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 blah. Um, so uh, the 1990 regulations to reduce acid rain, you all remember acid rain in the North, Northeast, um, you know, there was a lot of pushback then. Um, it was going to cost industry money. It was going to send everybody out of business. And so um, what they were saying is increase compliance costs, risk of reliability of electric service, disrupt the long-range planning of utilities. Um, but actually, it um, increased. <laughs> so industry went from $5.5 billion to $7.1 billion annually. Um, and and it, it uh, created an overall economy benefit of $78 billion. That's big numbers. That's bigger numbers than I like to deal with when you come out of that. So, you know, this, this, this scenario of government regulation is going to kill business proves that it actually improved business. So, um, one of the things I always like to remind people that this is pretty deep and heavy stuff and it can get pretty big and overwhelming. Um, and that, you know, this is about progress, not perfection. It's not going to be, you know, you're going to, you're 
you're going to forget to turn a line out. That's okay. You know, don't beat yourself up. But if we implement these small changes, that we can really start to make big changes, and it will really help us um, meet those goals. And then to, to lift it up, hopefully I can lift it up after all this sort of heavy stuff. Um, I really adopt this when it comes to sustainability, which is sow seeds of hope, right? It's, you know, you think about that little mustard seed parable. And we don't, we don't, have, to, we don't have to solve where we're importing all our energy in from Georgia, but what we can do is, is we can help make sure we don't need so much of it imported, right? Whether we're going to be getting a leaf or whether we're going to carpool more or bike or whatever. Um, I've been saying for three years now that I'm going to buy a bicycle and bike in church. However, it's not perfection. Um, and that um, those little things start to add up and make real change. So, okay. Any questions? All right. I'm going to stop this real quick. Are there churches in North Georgia?